Okay, so how are you guys doing today? Wow. You know, I'll take that for today. It's that kind of day. How was you guys' weeks? Yeah. Oh, just, just you is very good. <laughs> you got to go to school? Wow, round of applause. I wish I was that excited about school when I was your age. Oh, man. So, I mean, it seems like it was a pretty meh day for a uh, week for everyone, which is cool and awesome. But I am excited that we, again, get to meet together. We get to worship, read the word. So I'm going to try my best to not preach a very long time this time. Whatever happens, happens. But I would like to make room. <laughs> you see what I did there? <laughs> that was good. Oh, man, I'm becoming a dad. I don't even have a kid yet. Anyways. Um, oh, that's bad. I feel like leaving. Anyways. Um, so, yes, I would like to make the space for small groups a bigger time. I know you guys love having conversations at the end, and sometimes we're pushing 930, and we got some, you know, your parents waiting outside. So I'm going to do my best, my best to keep it more concise so you guys have more time to talk and have fun in your small groups. But the message is still going to be deep, though. So any of you guys remember what did we talk about last week? And who knows what sermon? Oh, wow, hands. Okay. Whichever. You could go. Ladies first. Ladies first. Abraham. Yes, we talked about Abraham. And you wanted to add something? Yeah. I was looking at this guy and I thought he was talking. And I was like, why is his voice that high? <laughs> and then I saw your head moving like that. I was like, oh, wait, no, I'm wild enough. It's. That's why I hate masks. I can't even tell who's talking, who's making faces and stuff like that. For all I know, there could be like one of you in the back who's just like this the whole time. I've had that happen to me one time. That's why I miss masks. I remember I was speaking a certain passage in the Bible, and it was like one of those harder to read passages, and he was just like, <laughs> I miss that though. I miss that. Anyways, yes. Yeah, so we talked about Abraham. We talked about the timing of Abraham. And does anyone remember what sermon series we're in? I might have said it already. Does anyone? We, got, we need to stop doing that. Me and Matt are going to have to start communicating a little bit more. I, I, we love Matt, by the way. He's been helping out with slides. My man came in already with a whole, like, doctor's degree and, like, slides. He's like, don't worry. Like, like, I was like, okay. So, yeah, let's get through this. So, last week we talked about Abraham, and there was three big points. The first one was he makes the impossible possible and we talked about how Abraham had seen God do so many things in his life yet when it came to having a son having a child with his wife Sarah he didn't trust God and he actually laughed at God he laughed and even Sarah laughed they both laughed fun fact that word Isaac means I think it means to laugh or something like that and so they were like, we're old. We can't have a kid. What the heck? Meanwhile, God was giving him victory in battle. God was protecting him from pharaohs and kings. And yet he didn't believe God for it. And then we come towards the end and we see they finally have the kid. They finally have the faith. And they're like, wow, God, this is crazy. This is awesome. Point two is we should always be prepared to give God anything he asks of us. I had put this part extra in it and I didn't say it last week. And I'm like, dang, that would have been better. But we should always be prepared to give God anything he asks of us, even when it hurts, right? And so we talked about how Abraham, the story where he had to give up Isaac, right? And again, crazy story. If you didn't have the chance to read it or listen or you weren't here last week, it's going to be up on YouTube. So check that out, hopefully this week or the next week, right? And we talked about the story with Abraham and Isaac and how God asked him to give him back to him. And it's a crazy novella story. We don't have time to go back into it. But it was this idea of you, when we, when we applied it to ourselves, whatever God gives us, we always have to be ready to give it back to him if he asks for us. Because he knows the big picture. He sees the big picture. He knows what we want. He knows what, what we need. He knows evidently the plans he has for us. And lastly, it was trust him with your future. Same, same idea. You know, do we trust him just in the little things or do we trust him with the big things? Do we only trust him when it's easy to trust him, when we, we like, yeah, God, you can do that, or in the moments where he's asking something great of us, 
when he's asking us to lay something down, when he's asking us to give something up? Do we still trust that he's God of our future? And so in light of talking about this, you know, friends of God and who were close to, to Jesus, um, there is a, a certain disciple who is always hanging with Jesus that I want to talk about. You guys might know him. Who do you guys think I might be talking about? Yeah, I mean, we raise hands here, but... <laughs> um, yeah, but we're going to be talking about Peter. If there's anything who knows any, a, a little bit about this Jesus guy, it'd probably be him, right? Because he walked on earth with him for a while while Jesus was here on earth. And so we're going to be going through First Peter and Second Peter. If you have anything to take notes with, feel free to take that out. If you have Bible, Bible app, you can use that. Again, please know Instagram. Or you know what happens if you use Instagram. No one tell anybody. It's just like, it's just like everyone's like serious looking down. <laughs> Nothing. I always make a joke that I'll throw hands with you outside if I see you on Instagram. It's not gonna happen. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna we're not gonna read First Peter uh, and Second Peter in its entirety. We're gonna kind of break certain pa uh, passages down and read them and see what we can get from them. We won't have time to go through all of it. And again, I see it's 8.04 already. I want to end around 8.30. Um, and so I'll try to hit the major points that I saw that kind of shined uh, or kind of, I feel like, came off the book while I was reading it, where I'm like, yeah, our youth of today need to hear these things. These are good topics. And so we're going to start at 1 Peter chapter 2. And uh, Matt, you'll track with me because I'll be skipping some verses um, that I feel like are a lot and too much to go into detail with um, but we'll start at verse one and so Peter is saying therefore rid yourself of all malice and all deceit hypocrisy envy and slander of every kind like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good we're going to skip to verse nine Matt Let's just go all the way. Cool. Awesome. Um, it says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We're going to keep going through chapter two, but I want to break these verses down so we understand what's happening. Unless someone thinks they know what's being said, feel free to raise your hand. But after this, we're just going for it. Cool. So, <laughs> I know, I have the NIV. I should probably get like a, a more simplified Bible. Pastor got this for me a long time ago, so it sounds all like, thus saith the Lord-ish. So don't worry, we'll break it down. But basically, Peter is saying, get rid of deceit, gossiping, envy over other people, slander, like, like talking against other people. Get rid of all these things and all these habits you used to have before I came into the picture. Because when I, and, and he's referring to Jesus, when Jesus entered the picture, we started to get a better understanding of, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. Oh, I shouldn't be doing that. Oh, the world says this is okay, but the, I think the Bible says something different. He's saying you once were not children of God because we know by faith we become children of God, right? We're either lost or found. I'm going to make that, you know, kind of thing for you guys now so you know that. Um, but when I chose into Jesus and I had faith in Jesus, I had permission to not be who I was before. And so Peter is saying, hey, keep being who God called you to be. Stop, get rid of all those things that you used to be and all those things, all those habits and bad habits you used to have. Verse 11 says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Again, he's saying the same, same thing. 
get rid of the sinful desires, getting, get rid of all the, the, the things you used to do. But then he says something interesting, right? You might say, well, who are pagans? Among the pagans, what does that mean? All that means is people who served other gods, people who didn't follow God, people who had many gods, all kinds of weird gods or idols that they would serve. And he's saying that they, that they accuse you of doing wrong, um, even though they accuse you of doing wrong, that they may see your good deeds, which means that they may see that you're good, doing good things, that this Jesus thing isn't something that you put on a bumper sticker on your car, that they see the fruits of it by what you're doing, how you treat people, how you're living your life. And then he says, uh, so that they would glorify God on the day he visits us when Jesus returns. Now we're going to skip all the way to verse 19. And this is where things get kind of real. Right, So it says, for it is commendable, it is good, if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. I'm going to make this make sense, so don't worry. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. I'm going to put up my first point if you're taking notes, and it'll help make sense of that whole uh, passage. Live righteous, uh, righteously and let the Lord be your what? Defender. Yes, let the Lord be your defender. So I was talking with the team and explaining a little bit what Peter was saying. Peter's basically saying, what good is it if you get, uh, I guess I'll say it like this, if you get hurt, if you get name called, if people come against you for being bad? He was like, no, the Lord commends. The Lord likes the times where you do what he called you to do. You do what's right in the Lord, and I'll make sense of this, and people come against you. Because a big part of our walk, and what's funny is we talked, this, talked about this a little bit before the word happened, is like, here's the reality. Some people, unfortunately, my little people, my friends, um, are going to mistreat you and make fun of you because you follow Jesus. Some people are going to joke on you. Some people might respect it and let you have your space. Or some people might call you the goody two-shoe, the little Christian boy, the Christian girl, and, and say all those things. And in those moments, although you're not suffering to the degree that disciples suffered, because they were literally dragged out, beaten, stoned, and stuff, but you're still suffering to a degree. You're still being name-called for being a Christian. You're still people coming against you for being Christian. Here's the problem that we have, though. Um, as Christians um, or as people in general, a lot of times we like to take things into our own hands, right? Like someone name calls us and all of a sudden we're just clapping back. Like, you know, like I still deal with that to this day. The Lord is freeing me of some things, you know? Um, but like something happens to us and immediately we're clapping back or somebody pushes us and immediately we're pushing back. Or something crazy happens and we try to take it into our own hands. I don't know. How many of you guys ever felt like you did the right thing and somehow still got punished for it? Yeah? <laughs> Welcome to life. Hi, I'm George. This happens, especially when you're a Christian. But here's the thing, and I'll give a very, very small testimony. I went through something crazy like that in high school, too. You know, for a long time in high school, I kind of did things my own way. I kind of just were with groups that I shouldn't have been with. I talked the way I shouldn't. I acted the way I shouldn't. I had a lot of hurt. I thought I was the man. I used to be like this dude who thought he was too cool for everybody. And I, I still am like that sometimes, but like I'm a lot more saved now. <laughs> um, and uh, it's crazy thinking back because I felt like I was like a whole different person. I was, it was bad. Like it was really bad. 
But needless to say, when I was pushing towards senior year into college, I started feeling that tugging in my heart of, man, I don't want to live this, this way anymore. I'm going to church, but I'm living the same. There's this God that's here, and I want to be like the person he's calling me to be. I don't want to be like this anymore. And the minute that I felt that tugging, I was like, Lord, then, you know, take me, to, take me where I need to be. Help me be who I'm supposed to be. And doors opened up to go to a Christian college, And I'm not saying you all have to go to a Christian college, but what I am saying is that was the door God opened up for me. And I was just like, okay, God, you know, if that's what we want, then then we're kind of doing that or whatever. Crazy enough, in my senior year of high school, I felt all the resistance in the world from every angle. I was losing friends. I was, gossip started about me out of nowhere, where two of my closest friends, we'll call them Tim and Doug, because we don't throw out names here. And Doug was gossiping about me to, all the, to the point that other schools who didn't even know me were listening to this gossip as if it was truth. And I remember my final year, I was like, God, why the heck did this just get harder? Like, you know, I, I thought things were going to get easier. I thought like I was going to become more like you. Yeah, I'm feeling all the resistance. I mean, every day I walked in senior year, I was filled with fear and anxiousness. And like, do I have to fight somebody today? Like, It was literally like that. And I remember the Lord spoke to me through one of my leaders and he said, hey man, address the guy who who started the gossip. Just ask him to talk, have a nice conversation with him and then let it go. And I remember I went to the guy and I was like, hey man, Uh, he was was around some friends or whatever. And it was bad. Like even my ex-girlfriend got in on the gossip. It was wild. Like everybody was in on it. I was like, did I actually do this? Like I'm starting to believe that, you know? And I went and I talked to him. I was like, hey, man, like, would you be able to talk like, you know, like one on one? Like, can we just talk about things? And he literally looked at me. He said, no. And I was like, "Okay." And I walked away. And at that point, I literally I remember talking to my leader and it was like, I'm letting this go. I know this is scary and I feel like it's a broken bridge and I might not ever get closure on it, but I'm letting it go to you, God. Years passed by and uh, some other whack stuff happened. Nothing crazy. The Lord really protected me that whole time in school. It's wild thinking back. But I found out later um, through my best friend who managed to be friends with Tim, we'll say, with Tim's girlfriend. And I found out through her years, years later when I had let it go to God and just let God deal with it, um, that Doug, when they went off to college, ended up turning on Tim. And everything that they put me through, they put him through. And the girlfriend said to me as, I, as we had met up for a hangout immediately, she's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry for all the things that happened here, here, here. And then she goes uh, and she talks about Tim and she says, hey, you know, it's funny because Tim said one day, man, it's really messed up. Like, I, like George was right this whole time and we put him through all this stuff. The crazy part is, is I still see the blessings and the fruit of making the decision to let God deal with that to this day where it exploded on itself. I think oftentimes we want God to deal with things, but we're not willing to step out of the situation. We're not willing to step out of that circumstance. Like we're like, God, I'll give this to you, but I'm just going to check up. I'm still going to be involved. Like I'm still going to talk with them. I'm still going to hang with them just to make sure you're doing what you should be doing, God. Like, and then I wonder, is that really giving something up to God? Matthew chapter five, verse 10 through 12 I want to read that to you. Uh, We have it here. Let me just turn one page. It says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say, all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, this is nothing new. And I don't want to say that I was an ultra Christian in senior high school. I was changing. I was trying to get out of a lot of things. I was trying to change the way I did things and move closer to God. And it wasn't easy, you know, It wasn't easy at all, but what I know is that vengeance is not ours to take. There's other passages that talk about this. Vengeance is not ours to take. 
Even if we turn to Romans chapter 12, if you don't believe me. Romans chapter 12, verse 14 through 21. Okay, yeah. I would say, what I would say this is, and this is no pressure for you or anything, but um, the, at some point, the deeper you continue to grow your relationship with God and Christ, you, at some point, you would want to, you know, be public. And I'm not saying be one of those Christian Bible bumpers that are like, go to heaven, like, like go do this or you're going to hell. You're, you're a sinner. Like, that's the problem. We have too many Christians doing that. <laughs> and that's not how we do church. And if you've ever seen someone do that, I'm so sorry that you had to endure that. That's not real faith Christianity. That, I don't know what that is. That's some off-brand, like, stuff that people are doing. <clears throat> But at some point, whether it's baptism, like if you got into a relationship with somebody you really loved and cared about, you wouldn't be afraid to be like, yeah, that's my man, you know? Like, yeah, that's, that's like, you see, like, that's, that's, that's mine. Like, all right, back up. Like, you wouldn't be afraid to do it. In the same way, I feel like sometimes we often put other things and other people on platforms, yet we don't do the same with Christ. Like, hey, there's this person, this Jesus that came into my life, and he's changing things around. Like, he's, 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 like things are changing. I have this joy that I don't even know what, where it's coming from. And it's not that, Evelyn, that you shove it down people's throats. Don't be that girl. But also don't be ashamed that you follow Jesus. Don't feel like no one should know. Like it's something to be embarrassed about because it's not. It's a privilege. It's an honor that you know him in that way. Does that help you out? I don't... Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, but Romans chapter 12, verse 14 through 21. It says... Again, bless those who persecute you um, and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people a low position. Do not be conceited. Guys, do not be conceited. I was super conceited in high school. I was, yeah. Like if he went to school with me. You were like probably like seven years old or something. <laughs> like... Don't be conceited. Yeah, clapping back. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Pastor Danny. Pastor Danny. He's like, Pastor, please. Yeah, you're clapping back. <laughs> humanist. Humanist. But do not repay anyone evil for evil like I just did to Axel. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now check out this verse. This is the most powerful verse in it. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with I think it was Martin Luther King that said you can't darkness doesn't drive out darkness only light does that hate doesn't drive out hate only love does that you want to change people's life react like Jesus would and don't react like a normal person would show them that you're different show them that there's this God who changed your life lastly I'm going to go into 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, 3 for the second part of 2 Peter. And then we're going to go to point 2. Have it up there. Cool. So it says, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly intro uh, introduce destructive heresies. Basically, that means stuff that is not true in the Bible. It's like if I said Jesus was a woman. It's not in the Bible. That's heretical, you know. Yeah, Ariana Grande needs to come to youth group. That's what she needs to do. Uh, <laughs> even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will uh, bring the way of, of truth into disrepute. Uh, 
In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has uh, long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. Let's get point two up there. We can take it down. Devote yourself to scripture and beware, uh, beware of false teachers. Beware of false teachers. One of the biggest things I've been learning getting involved with small groups, getting involved with new believers class, quick plug. If you're a new Christian and you're looking to learn about the Jesus guy, come Wednesday nights at seven. We do it online or in person. We're on week three. We're talking about church and community. It's fun. It's exciting. Um, But one thing I've been learning digging deep into the Bible, and it's been so overwhelming, is that when you read the Bible, you become more hungry for the Bible. You end up having more questions. And I know, I get it. Does anybody love reading the Bible here? Okay, we got someone in the back. All right, cool. We have super saved Christians in the back. (laughs) When I was your age, I didn't love reading the Bible, though. So I know what it's like. I'd rather play games the whole day. I'd rather play, you know, some video games. I'd rather listen to some music. I'd rather be on my laptop and stuff. But here's what I understand. How am I going to be able to tell if someone's a false teacher or not, if I don't know my word. See, if we go on Instagram, someone could say anything and put Jesus on it, and we're like, oh, I guess. Like, I I guess. Can I be real with you? And I'm not going to say names. There's some celebrity pastors that we follow, and they preach some off-brand gospel that I'm like, where, what? Like, where in the Bible was that? Like, even the other day, and I was talking to Liz and I think Mariano about it, and I sent it, I sent it to him, a, a little link, and I was like, look at this. And <clears throat> it was something, the pastor was talking about something that I've done extensive research on, and it, it wasn't it. What he said wasn't it. And we're not talking about that. <laughs> um, and it wasn't it. And after it, I was just like, man, what if a new believer hears that? They have a conversation with somebody who knows a little bit about science and this and that. They debunk it, and now that person's like, oh, man, so maybe Jesus isn't real. We have to be really, really careful and know the scripture. In fact, in John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, if you can put it up, Matt, it says this. It says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There's a lot of people who are preaching a version of Jesus that isn't true to who he is in this Bible. But how will you know if you don't read it? Now, I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying tomorrow, open up every book of the Bible, read it from beginning to end. No. But man, there's Bible plans. There's small groups. There's so many resources online than ever before to get started somewhere and start asking questions. You have leaders all around here who would love to answer some questions about Bible, about faith. And you'd be surprised. You might ask us a question we don't know and we have to go do our research on, right? One of my fears is that we would get so used to just wanting to pray and hear the voice of God. And that happens. I'm not saying it doesn't. Or hoping that God just texts our phone so we can know what he's saying. But here's the thing. A lot of us are asking, what is God? What do you want me to do? God, what's the voice of God? When this is the living, breathing word of God. We're spending a lot of time because we live in an instant gratification culture where, Lord, just speak to me. Just speak to me. Just speak to me. And his word is here. His word is here. And you can read the same verse so many times, and yet something it hits a different part of your heart. Can I encourage you because I wish I would have done it instead of trying to cram all this knowledge from college until now that I'm 26 um, into my head. I wish I would have read this just a little bit more because I would have so many moments. And I, I think I said it a few weeks ago where some guy told me, if you haven't spoken in tongues, you're not going to heaven. And I was like, oh, no, oh, no. All this time, all this stuff I did, I'm going to hell now. Like, and I, like I said before, I, I talked to a guy named Felipe, and he opened the word of God with me, and he explained things to me. And I was like, whew, okay, I'm going to heaven. Cool. You know? Know your word. Know your scripture. Don't, don't take this for granted that you have this. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 through 5, and then we're going to get into our third point. Promise. We're doing good to, on time today. Praise the Lord. 
2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 through 5. And this verse is very powerful. Get ready because this is our world today. You guys ready for this verse? Wow, so I heard a no. <laughs> Was that you? Oh, okay. Oh, oh, we're all fighting after church. No. <laughs> okay, so check this out. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. What does that mean, really quick? It means there will be a time where people won't put up with what the Word of God actually says. What it says, you know, you can ignore certain verses, but it's there. It says, instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. But they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. What does that mean? Can someone tell me what that means? What does that passage mean? You good. Yeah. 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 You know why people do that? No, it's okay. You're just being real. You know why people do that is because they're afraid of what that might uh, cost them if it's true. They're afraid of what that might cost them if this Bible is true. So I rather do my best to disprove God than change the things that need to be changed. I rather do my best to throw everything at him to try to disprove this God that whether or not I believe or not, he still is there. I rather do that than take accountability for the way I'm living my life because I rather be my own God and do what I want, right? So here's the thing, here's the thing with uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 to 5, is that there's people who are looking to hear what they want to hear. So they're going to surround themselves with teachers who tell them what they want to hear, with people who are going to keep telling them what they want to hear. You know, and for me, my biggest thing is, man, I searched, uh, I searched through what other religions serve. I searched through what they do, what they have, and man, there is nothing there is not, not a, a single other religion or, or whatever, even universe stuff that's new. I don't even know where that came from. He just pulled it out of the ground and said, this is a new thing. Like, and yet so many people are more susceptible to do that. Why? Because there's no accountability. I could... <laughs> it's like Dr. Frank Turek said. He said, I, it's so that I can be spiritual but not have any accountability. And so... People, hold on, let me just finish so we can get into small groups and then we're going to have a time to like have big conversations about all this stuff. So the reality is people are going to surround themselves with people who tell them what they want to hear instead of hearing the truth, hearing the word of God for what it is because he is good. He is holy. Unfortunately, we are not. Nobody here is God. Nobody here has gone to heaven and come back like Jesus said uh, when we talked about that in our last, uh, last week. And so I'll, to kind of close things out, uh, I'm going to read uh second peter chapter three we're gonna go through one more point and we're gonna break out to small groups and we're gonna have to have all the fun conversations that i know we want to have you guys excited for that cool so i'm gonna read through this very fast let's actually i'm gonna start on verse 10 i'm gonna start on verse 10 matt uh second peter uh no actually Let's start at verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Okay, yeah, let's start there. It says, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it 
has since the beginning of creation, but they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, instead he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear um, with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done since will be laid bare. I'll stop there and then we'll go to point three. If we can put point three up there. Just toss point three. The Lord is coming, so we have to live in preparation. What is Peter saying in chapter three? There's so much more content. And I, I challenge you guys, hold on, we'll, we'll talk in small groups. Um, I challenge you guys to write down Peter, 2 Peter chapter three and read the whole thing in its entirety. But what Peter is basically saying is that in the last days, there are gonna be people who, who are scoffers, who are gonna tell you, well, when is this Jesus guy supposed to come back? Oh, it's been a thousand years. It's been here. It's been there, right? Peter makes a, a comparison. He says, they were like that in the days of Noah. You guys know who Noah was? They were like that in the days of Noah. And Noah preached the gospel while building this ark, getting them prepared, saying, hey, the, the Lord is about to do this crazy thing. It's going to rain and, and it's going to wipe out. Like there's too much evilness in the world. They didn't listen. When he got in with his family and the Lord, it said the hand of the Lord shut that door closed. They were knocking on the ark. Let us in, let us in. But the Lord had shut the door. The Lord had shut the door. And then he says that the day of the Lord, when Jesus comes back, will be like a thief in the night. What does that mean for us? That means that every single day, man, we can't take it for granted. Because he could come tomorrow, right? So what does that mean for us? How should we ought to live? And I'm not saying you can't have dreams and aspiration. Like I said in my, in my little team meeting before I, I came up here, I said, listen, some of you are called to be, you know, actors, actresses, doctors, lawyers. All, not everyone's called to be a pastor, a preacher, a speaker. Some of you are called to do that alongside with God. But the reality is my question is, again, are we leaving God in the back burner and chasing our dreams or are we bringing him along with us? Are we letting him guide us? Are we letting him do things his way? Are we trying to do it our way? Lastly, before, and we could all rise, say 35, we could all rise. Um, if I could just get uh, Liz and Mark, you're fine. Um, and actually, the whole team, you could all come up. All full team, that's fine. We're going to do that song one more time. We're going to worship a little bit. We'll go for like 10 minutes. Let's end at like 845. And then uh, we'll break on to small groups. And if I can get my prayer, people over there on the left. Uh, the reality, um, as I kind of close, is I think the biggest reason why a lot of us take our days for granted is because we think we have forever. I can just do that tomorrow. I can just worry about that tomorrow. It's okay if I do it. I'll just ask the Lord for forgiveness and he'll do this and that. And man, I wonder if I had that same mindset in my own relationships, right? Like what if I was like, oh, it's okay if me and Liz fight today. There's always tomorrow to, to try to mend things and stuff. And you know, I'll just talk to her next week is fine. Like Yet we do it to God. And that's why I love bringing it back to a human level because sometimes when we do that, not always because God is God, but sometimes when we break it down a little bit, we're like, dang, we really switch up on God all the time. And so to close, I just want to run through those points again real quick. Again, live righteously and let the Lord be your defender. So what does that mean? 
Be careful with how you treat others, even when they wrong you. Don't repay evil with evil. It's not worth it. Man, that story I told you is just one story. There's many people who put me through some really ugly, bad things, and I wish I could have done something about it. I really do. But I left it in God's hands, and man, the stuff, the way God does things is different. And I'm like, oh, yikes. <laughs> like, okay. Like, God is jealous over you, man. You think he enjoys when you guys go through suffering and persecution and hardship? No. Man, he's a good dad. Secondly, devote yourself to scripture and beware of false teachers. <laughs> what does that mean? <clears throat> Be careful who you're listening to. Even if there's something I might say that's off, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to, to do your own research and read your word. Now, I do extensive research, so that's probably going to be hard for me to ever say something wrong like that. But And if I did, Mariano and Pastor Nick would probably kill me. But I, even for me, I have teachers above me that correct me when I say something that might not be fully accurate. And so we make sure to try to give you guys the purest gospel that we possibly can. That's one thing I love about this church. We don't free ball. We don't make things up. We don't all oh, say this verse means this. Like we do our research. And lastly, the Lord is coming. So we have to live in preparation. So what does that mean? Be careful with how you're living your life. Be careful of what your day to day looks like. Right? Man, talk to God. Spend time with him. Don't dismiss this scripture. I know for a lot of you, it might not be fun. It might not be, it might be boring at times. But man, what can I tell you? When you get deep into this stuff, your mind's going to open. Your mind's going to open up. Because you know what I think we deal with? A lot of us young people, especially us, us guys, and I dealt with it too. We act a lot on emotion, but we don't think. We act a lot out of emotion, but we don't stop to think. We don't stop to think before we do things. We don't stop to think to see if we're going to hurt someone by the things we say or by what we do. We don't stop to think about what this might mean for me. And can I encourage you guys, man, if there's something I wish I told myself when I was in like fourth, fifth grade, it's like, bro, think. Stop talking. Stop acting. Just think about what you're going to do. And so we're going we're gonna to pray. And I got my two little prayer workers over there, guy with guy, girl with girl. And we're going to go for, I'm going to do for like five, ten minutes-ish, maybe, something like that. And then we're going to break out into small groups. Amen. Just bow our heads and close our eyes real quick. Lord God, I just pray, Father, that as we go into worship, Lord, that um, you would keep these questions stirring in each and every person's hearts so that when we go into small groups, we can talk for like almost a half an hour and let it all out like I know all of us want to do, and we want to have the cool, amazing, deep conversations. Um, but Father, I just thank you for this message. I thank you, God, that your word is sharper than any two du or double-sided or double-edged sword. Lord, I thank you that this, this sermon was thought-provoking, God, and I thank you that this sermon uh, is going to be such a great platform and bridge to now have such awesome conversations with our small group leaders. Lord, I thank you, and I pray that you'd continue to move in this place. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.